Welcome to episode three of the Ballers Blog podcast as we are joined by special guest Rory McConaughey of Bath in England as we discuss his journey from university rugby to the World Cup. I'm pleased to say that me and Ollie are joined by Rory McConaughey of Bath in England. Rory, how are you doing? Yeah, very good, thanks. Not too bad. Pleasure to be here. How have you been keeping busy at this difficult time at the moment? Have you been on a training programme with Bath or anything like that? Um, yeah, so luckily luckily Bath was sort of, well, we felt we were, we were ahead of the game and we sort of prepped uh, programmes for every individual if, if the worst case happened and the season was postponed and we had to go home and only train from home. So luckily we had, we had programs all sorted for us. Um, we're, we're lucky at the moment to have a house that's sort of in a rural area. Um, so there's lots of fields around. There's a rugby pitch opposite for, from a local club. And then we've got a garage where we've tried, attempted to make a home gym in, which I'm not sure has, has gone too well, but it's, it, it will definitely do for now. Was it slightly frustrating with the obviously season being postponed at the point it was as you were starting to pick up a bit of form after you come off the back of obviously recovering from a couple of injuries? Yeah, I guess a bit frustrating. Obviously, we just want to play and um, I was looking forward to just getting some games under my belt, which I which I hadn't really had since coming back from Japan and it had been a bit of a a few niggles that weren't massive injuries, but they'd kept me out for sort of two or three weeks at a time. Um, so, yeah, I was looking forward to getting some game time, but obviously you can't do anything about it. And um, there's a lot more important issues at hand than, than just rugby at the moment. So, yeah, it was it was annoying, but this could be a little blessing in disguise for, for myself and some other players in terms of just getting our bodies right going forward and, who knows? You might get a few players out of this getting an extra year on top of their on their playing careers. You mentioned that obviously rugby isn't the most important aspect of life at the moment. Um, we've seen on social media that you were part of the Shave Donate Nominate campaign set up by your friend Alex Davis. How how is it seeing that rise to around twenty grand or so has been raised so far? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Hit twenty five. Uh, yesterday, I think, um, or the day before, yeah. So it's it's been incredible. Look, AJ, I know him well from the sevens, and I got to know him uh, briefly before it, whilst I was sort of on trial there. Um, is he's such a top bloke, and he's done a lot of things. He he sort of uh, orchestrated the Brave the Shave for Macmillan Cancer when we when we were part of the sevens. He's done other like charitable charitable things, and then obviously getting this shave donate nominate going and i think at the start it was a it was a grand target that we set so to to reach twenty five thousand pounds is is pretty incredible and and uh, you know it's an awesome it's an awesome cause for it and he he's definitely the brains behind the ideas but you know there's a there's a few of us that we spoke about it well he he floated the idea to us and um yeah we're it's it's just happy to see it do so well and get so much exposure yeah, that's great work so far. So moving on to, or well, going back to towards the start of your career and how you've kind of come on this journey over the matter of about four or five years, is it? Yes, I believe. yeah, yeah. Uh, from starting all the way back at University of Gloucestershire, but before that you took a year out after school, I believe, to go to New Zealand. How did you feel that helped you develop when you were out there playing rugby? Yeah, I think it massively helped me, I think. You know, growing up and going through school and local sort of village club rugby, I was always I was always good, but I was never I was never like a county or an academy standard, and I'd I'd always keep playing rugby because I enjoyed it and, and loved it, and that's that's what I wanted to do um, alongside whatever career I went into. So when I go, went out to New Zealand, and the aim there was uh, to get experience as a as a teaching assistant, which I did. Um, and I just ended up falling into a rugby club uh, almost by accident. Uh, one of the teachers at the school uh, knocked on our door one day and just said they were short numbers for a sevens tournament. And if we wanted to play, me and me and the other gap student that were there, so we were super keen and ended up playing there all year for that club. And um, 
you know, it, it definitely definitely helped us as a as a first exposure into men's rugby, but also obviously being over in New Zealand where where um amateur the amateur game I think is is a such a higher standard than the amateur game here um helps helps massively. You know, a lot of a lot of their super rugby players or New Zealand Sevens players will go back to their local clubs if they're not picked and and play for them, which is something that you don't get here. Um so, you know, being exposed to to super rugby level of of player um, at that stage of my career was was awesome. Knowing what they did to train and and how they got to the the positions that they were in. So coming back to England, moving to uni, off the back of that, what was kind of the aim with your rugby? What as it was maybe a kind of a step up, as you mentioned, if there's if you weren't particularly perhaps an academy level player at the time. Um, yeah, I guess the aim didn't really change coming back to uni I wanted to I wanted to obviously crack into the uni first team I, I didn't know much about the uni rugby levels at that point um, and I you know I picked uni of Gloucestershire because um, because it had a good it had a great teaching school at the end of it for if I wanted to do my PGC and that that was honestly the aim probably up until the beginning of my fourth year um, at uni there so yeah it, it was just it was in make sure I enjoyed it as well. Um, you know, the any sports social side is is awesome at uni, and and that's that's the reason why a lot of people join the clubs. And it, it definitely was an incredible three or four years socially. And I've you know I'm still on a WhatsApp group with 26 other mates that I met through uni, um, and we're all sort of in or around the rugby club um, environment. So it's you know it's it's a very memorable experience, and I think. The fact that I had a coach at the time called Phil Llewellyn. Um, he was sort of my mentor as of, sort of second and third year. He took me and a few other players up to Nuneaton RFC in, in National 3. And that's probably our first exposure at proper men's rugby in, in England. Um, and he also sort of promoted me and one other guy called Mark Lingard at the time. He was a uni captain. Um, we went and did England students. Uh, trial first year didn't get in and then the second year uh, managed to get in and both get our caps uh, which was yeah incredible and and from there I got that exposure to uh, to the students game where you know in the past not not a lot of University of Gloucestershire players or or of or of that uni level would get a look in with the students and I think it sort of opened the door and made made the selection think actually there's a lot more rugby players out there than those just in the top leagues so it, it was I think it was great um for the union for unis alike like us um and personally you know if I hadn't haven't done that if I hadn't been put forward by Phil and been able to perform for uni I wouldn't have been able to have sort of got that trial originally for England sevens you mentioned Phil there the you were also there at the time of the current coaches of Chris Downs and Ben Smith. Um, what kind of influence did they have on your game individually and how did they help you kind of push on to be able to play in those kind of national one levels at that, in like your third year? Um, yeah, I guess I, 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 won't, I won't lie and say Downsy was the, was the skills expert for my back play, but um, <laughs> no, it, it's, I think at that, um, at that level, like, people like Downsy, like Smithy, like Phil, we had a guy called Dave Barley, like you've got to be you've got to be a good bloke and you've got to get along with with the players as well off the pitch. And I think that's what they most of them got, you know, they got right. And so yeah, I um I met Chris Downs through through the uni. He came in he came in, I think at in my second year, um, he started helping out with a lot of the forwards. Um, obviously, he's not a, he's not a back three um, or a centre, so he's not going to help my skill set in that way. But the fact that he could have a relationship with the players and be open and be able, be honest with them, I think, makes a massive difference. Um, I remember doing more sort of back sessions. Phil would help out, but Smithy would be there as well every sort of Monday and Friday night as it was, or maybe a Sunday night. Um, and it does, it makes, it makes a huge difference for those that obviously are there to be part of the rugby club and socialize, 
but also want to improve their game. Um, I think, you know, someone, someone with Downsy's experience helped massively with some of the front rowers. Um, I know a lot of the boys loved it when he came in and it made it made a massive impact for our, for our forwards. Um, and then obviously there was Smithy, there was, there was Phil, there was Dave Barley, there was a guy called Stu Bradfield as well. Um, which, you know, they all, they all helped out massively with us and, you know, to put that effort in, um, for us, uh, when a lot of other people wouldn't, um, it, you know, is, is great. Looking back on playing uni rugby, are there areas you perhaps miss that you not may not quite get in professional level rugby? Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know, I, I I remember I remember chatting to some of the guys before Varsity a couple of years ago, and um, it reminded me of something I think Will Greenwood had said to to Durham before before a uni game where he went, and I, I like. Uni rugby is is like no other, I guess, uni sport. But there's no other um, sporting environment where you're that close with everyone around you. Um, you know, some of my best mates are from uni, and to be able to um, live with sort of six six rugby guys, you go to lectures together, you train together, you go out together, you sort of enjoy everything like the whole part of life together. It's it's something very very unique, and you know some of the the best times I had was was at uni and you know varsity especially um, those occasions were just incredible when you're at uni it's, it's the biggest thing it's some some sometimes for some people it's the biggest thing they'll ever have uh, rugby wise and it's it's just awesome awesome experiences and memories that you know last a lifetime. So you mentioned getting to the varsity level. What was from starting from? when you were fresher, what was your kind of journey through the club really? Um, so I, I joined, yeah, I joined, I joined whenever in 2011, um, we had our freshest trials. I actually got injured straight away in the freshest trials. Um, <laughs> so I didn't actually start really playing rugby until around Christmas time, um, in my first year. And then in that, it was sort of finding my feet. And although I, I sort of, um, back to my own ability, it was at the time you were sort of a new guy in uni and all you had was a Monday night session really to, to sort of showcase what you had. So it was it was about just enjoying it, enjoying the Wednesday nights, but also sort of trying to work your way up from the freshers side to the thirds to the seconds of, and eventually the first. And I sort of I did that luckily with about a month or two to go of the season and just before varsity. So <clears throat> managed to crack the... The varsity squad in my first year, which was which was awesome. I think uh, we actually played Hartbury that year at King's Home, and it was yeah, it was it was obviously honestly obviously my first experience of varsity and made me realise like, how cool it was. Um, and then moving into second and third years, we had um, the the change up was that obviously me and Mark were playing on a Saturday for Nuneaton, so it was. It was balancing, um, obviously, our rugby career, uh, our, our rugby growth and wanting to get better as a player and then sort of picking and choosing which games actually to, to play for uni and which not to. If, if, it was a, if it was a bigger game on the Saturday or if it was a bigger game on the Wednesday, then, then sort of we'd choose one of those. And, yeah, I guess it was uh, second year varsity was probably my favourite one. Um, we beat, it was the first time playing Worcester um, as a rugby side for me and it was yeah it was at the Prince of Wales Stadium complete sellout we walked down the steps through the crowd um, and we ended up winning I think it was a nail biter of a game I think we ended up winning by about two or three points with uh, (laughs) yeah Will Garnett um, was kicking our kicking our goals that, that night and like slotted a few from the touchline which was in the end was the big difference. So yeah, it was yeah, incredible to to be a part of something like that. Um third year was was my first first sort of loss to Worcester. Um and to be fair that was that was my first year when perhaps I sort of got the balance wrong in terms of uh overplaying and ended up having a lot of niggly injuries. Um and our our first 
scheduled match for the varsity was postponed because of some off field decision. Um, and I wasn't going to make that originally, but then I could make the second one, but we were also missing other people for that one. So it was, it was, it was a mixture of emotions and, and we lost in the end, but it was, I think we lost by four points and probably on paper, you looked at them and they're probably about 20 points better us than paper, but it was just one of those nights where it didn't fall for us, but we felt we were right up, right up there with them. Second year, you obviously had your started your involvement with Nuneaton. How was that kind of move for you? Uh, yeah, it was it was good. It was an awesome awesome couple of seasons there, and you know I, I absolutely loved it and loved the people there. Um, you know, Phil Phil obviously spoke to me and Mark about it. He he got the job up there as as head coach. So going up there, it was more. We'd never neither of us had played that that level. It was. Yeah, National Three at the time um, had played that level before. So um, it was more finding our feet at the start, um, figuring out, like obviously being complete newbies into the, into the setup. We didn't didn't want to just walk in and, and like pretend we were we were there for, for just the play and that was it. We wanted to completely get involved with it. Uh, so we had to sort of go up the Tuesday, Thursday nights and um, sort of about a three-hour round trip, I think it was. Um, and then obviously play Saturdays and then me and Mark both worked in a bar Saturday night so we used to get up at 8 Saturday morning go up to the eat and play or like as far as Scunthorpe sort of thing so it'd be like a 5 hour 6 hour round trip and then get, get back and work in the bars from about 10 till 4am in the morning As a kid I remember watching the Neat and play down at Harrogate a couple of times my local club and it's, uh, it's very encouraging to see that a pathway exists from the lower leagues up to the international arena uh, do you think that others can follow in your footsteps? Yeah, definitely. I, th- I, th- I don't see why you can't. I think obviously there's there's a big stigma, um, and I felt it as well going sort of that between that sixteen to twenty years of age, where if you're not an academy, if you're not in an academy setup, then you're deemed as not good enough for professional rugby. And you know, I made my professional debut when I was twenty four years old, so. It's there's there's a big chunk of my life there that I've missed out on um, that professional pathway, but it's still I I still made it into professional rugby in the end, and you know I've got I've got to thank those sort of grassroots clubs and the national leagues uh, where I stepped up from there for for that. Um, I think there's some quality players there, and you know what what Nuneaton did with me was was awesome. They they definitely developed me as a player, but then at the right point in time, they they pushed me on to another club, sort of higher up. So when I went to Hartbury RFC, um, that you know, Nuneaton were more than happy for me to go and you know and try and be as as good as I could be as a player. Well, you went to Hartbury in your third year of uni. Did you get much stick off the Gloucester boys for that? <laughs> so l- luckily, I was a fourth year. So at that at that point, um, I think most boys were were too worried to give a fourth year stick. Um, <laughs> but yeah, with, with my, you know, we had a we had a close group of mates. I think there was seven or eight of us that were doing four year fourth years, and that was either out of choice or boys that had to be there. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, so I think they they absolutely loved that. You know, I was I was playing national one, and I was playing with some of these academy kids that we would, we'd all heard of and we'd all followed from Gloucester throughout the years. Um, so it, yeah, again, it was it was a great experience. And at, at that point, you know, Hartbury was as close to a professional setup as you could get without being professional um, with their uni system and the way they had some you know the players in that were working at the uni, um, which is a pretty smart way to go about it, I guess. But it was, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was, again, um, a massive exposure for me. It was, you know, had these feeder players from premiership clubs. So it, the quality was, an, an, again, a massive step up. And, you know, at the same time, I was, I'd been spotted by England Sevens and was on trial there. So it was, it was, I'm glad I chose to do a fourth year. So you mentioned that, You'd been spotted kind of by the England Seven setup, and after uni, you went onto that pathway. How was that switch, and how did you feel it was a risk taking that jump to Sevens? Um, no, I wouldn't say it was a risk. I think, um, you know, I, I at the beginning of my fourth year, that's when they 
they'd asked me to trial off the back of playing for GB Uni Sevens, um, and I think that was the first time, probably in my life, that I thought actually um, I could be a professional rugby player. Sort of probably first time since I was sixteen, fifteen or sixteen, um, that I thought again that oh, like the dream's still there. Um, and so I just, I tried to go in and, and make the most out of it. And, you know, I was invited down for a week, but ended up being there for six weeks. Um, and at the end of it, it was, yeah, it was about October time. Um, they they said like, look, there's there's nothing, because it's the beginning of the season for us, there's there's nothing here in terms of budgets for, for contracts, but there's a possibility that we'd look to sign you for next year. Um, but we won't know until sort of March March time and um, so I went back to Hartbury um, tried to you know concentrate on that there and it was yeah in March thing they came out and you know offered me offered me the contract um, and at the same time Gloucester was sort of having conversations with me but there was nothing nothing really on the table um, and that was just through my Hartbury performances so I think at that at that time I think the risk would have been to say no and and you know, try and chase it with Gloucester. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm very happy I went with the sevens because it, yeah, turned out to be you know three three incredible years uh, traveling the globe and yeah, making you know making some mates for life. In the pre World Cup little videos I did of my story, um, Simon Amor talks about your attitude and being a team player. Do you think that's something that helped you? really push on in sevens and it's is it something you got from family um, i guess it's I, I, I think i put it down to probably my journey to get there i think you know i that's what i loved about rugby was that it was it the team game and um the environment that you're in and you know the social side of it as we've spoken about but it like it's like nothing else and i don't know many other sports um that are, that are like it and um i guess i always coming into the game late um it wasn't about making up lost time it was more just enjoying the moment because i never thought i'd be there and so i'd i'd make the most out of everything whether it was on the pitch um training playing or off the pitch um and doing what you could for the team if it's whatever whatever makes the team better and i think it helped obviously being in the environment with the sevens um they're very much it's it's a team first environment and uh you always because it was such a small sided game and you you're so exposed as an individual out on the pitch um that it has to be everything everything you do is about the team and um you know the leaders in our team at the time it was Tom Mitchell our captain James Robwell Phil Burgess they were it was very much promoting that team first thought and you know that that put me in great stead um, going forward, and they were, you know, great role models to learn off. Um, of when I did eventually make that switch to fifteens, I think it's fair to say that most young sportsmen's dream is to perhaps go to an Olympics or a World Cup. How did it feel to be announced in that squad for the Olympic Sevens, the inaugural? Um, tournament? Yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, I think. Obviously, I like growing up. Uh, rugby was obviously my main sport, but I also used to absolutely love athletics, and especially athletics in the Olympics, and and getting into all the events around the Olympics, um, whether it was athletics or or into the rowing. You know, my, I think my, my first my first memories of the Olympics was back in two thousand when Steve Redgrave won the record gold medal. Um, uh, it was Kathy Freeman, like Marion Jones, like all these different other Olympians that I remember watching on on the screen and um, growing up loving loving all the different events. And so to be able to firstly see rugby sevens get get involved before I was professional was was incredible, and then to actually be a part of it um, originally, even as a travelling reserve, you know, it was still. An, an incredible thing to be a part of and a dream come true even if, if I didn't set foot on that on that pitch it was still an awesome journey and um to be able to be in the Olympic Village with with all these incredible athletes that I'd seen on the screens growing up um was something very very surreal did you get to meet any of the big superstar athletes whilst mm. you were there 
yeah, obviously GB had a few of them. So, um, you know, every day we'd, we'd sit in similar areas of the, of the dining hall and, and stuff. And so like, like in the first lift I got in was full of the cyclists. So Bradley Wiggins was in there. Um, uh, oh, Wow, I've forgotten the name. That's bad of me. Um, <laughs> Chris Hoy, who wasn't actually he wasn't actually competing, but he was there as a, an advisor for the cyclists. Um, so yeah, it was it was awesome. Murray was in the same block of flats. A lot of these athletes that I'd, I'd watched in the years previous, um, Dean Asher Smith, who's done so well at the opening ceremony, and seeing all the other teams, seeing the American basketball team um walk past us it was just it was so cool so surreal it's like a lot of us were just like kids in a sweet shop really after that you decided to make the switch back to 15s how how did you kind of look to get back into the 15s game um i guess it was i guess it was something that you know i'd, I'd never done I wanted to give it a go. Um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to do three years in the sevens where I covered off all the major tournaments that we did. And w- like, luckily we were pretty successful in them. Um, so I think it was, it was that time, time to do it. And, you know, I spoke to my agent. Um, luckily our old analyst at the sevens is now an analyst at Bath and he had a good word to put in for me and sort of got my foot in the door there. And it wasn't really sorting off the uh, competition. It was more, more or less whoever was actually interested in me. And in the end, it was, it was pretty much just Bath. So I'm glad they put the faith in me. And um, yeah, I've been very happy since I've, since I've been here. That 2018-19 season when it kind of fell your way with a couple of internationals being away and a few injuries when you were on that run in the team and scoring and sharing your finishing capabilities, did you ever think England was an option? Yeah, so at, at, at the start of the year, my, my main goal was pretty much to learn as much as possible um, in, in that 12 months. And because I was coming in after a Sevens World Cup, I, I didn't do a pre-season with Bath. So it was more about actually, it's, it's not going to just work like that for me. And there's a lot of learning to do. So I sort of apply my trade and, in the Prem Shield or, or A-League um, and sort of if I do get an opportunity um, make the most be lucky that there was a few boys out injured a um, few boys on international duty to, so when I made my debut um, I think it was November time so it was just after that if I could get any more game time I could and you know obviously what happened happened and I was just trying to make the most of it. It, it helps, uh, definitely helps with when people don't know who you are um, <laughs> because they don't really know what to expect. So I think that helped me a lot and what you're capable of and what your strengths and, weak, strengths and weaknesses are. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it's um, it was it was just I'm just glad uh, I, I got my foot in the door at the at the time of the season that I did and and actually didn't get a terrible performance on my first on my first cap so how how was that when you how was it when you found out that you'd been selected and how was the lead up to your debut um so so i found out um i'd had rumors i'd had chats with uh, my one of the backs coaches at, at bath a guy called daz edwards and he'd sort of hinted to me that they they were looking at me for a potential barbarians game um and that you know that to me was incredible. I knew it was uncapped, but like to even be in the same sentence as was out was incredible. Um, and then so that's all I that's all I thought. I didn't hear anything else, so I was like, "Fair, that's it's all right. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's still been a pretty cool season." And then the day after our last game of the season, uh, we had like a we had a players social and. On the way to that, I get a missed call and a text off a number that I don't know. The text just said, like, it's Eddie Jones here. Give me a ring back when you can. Um, and so, yeah, I rang and didn't, didn't, didn't believe it at start. So I sort of checked the number without telling my mate um, who I was checking for on his phone, Zach Mercer. And it came up with as Eddie's number. So I was like, right, it is him. Um, so I gave him a call and he basically said, yeah, like, I've been really pressed. Um, 
with you this season and just want um yeah just want to let you know like you're in camp in in five weeks time so you know rest up and and just come in and just enjoy yourself so it was yeah pretty incredible and sort of the next sort of half an hour was a bit of a blur um and then yeah the the that was it into sort of three months worth of camp um and managed to finally get a cap at the end of it even though I'd stumbled twice at the at the final hurdle beforehand I'm actually currently reading Eddie's book and you get the impression that he just he drives players as hard as he can to get the best out of them but then the media kind of sometimes get the wrong idea that it's slightly a bit of arrogancy how is Eddie in his natural environment and how what were kind of your thoughts before of him before going into that camp um, yeah, obviously you heard like it was very intense camps and it'd be he absolutely bollocked the guys and, and worked them really hard. But then, you know, for me, I, I think coming from sevens, which that was pretty much every session we did anyway, it wasn't too much of a shock. I think that helped me massively. I, you know, I, I think if if you're wanting to be the best, not alone, let alone the best in the country, but the best in the world, you you want to be training at, you know, levels that are, that are more intense in a game and you want to be pushing yourself to the absolute max. So it, that, that was never an issue with me. Um, I think I knew, I think if I, if I worked hard, um, as long as I, I put as max effort in as possible, if, if I wasn't as good a player at the end of it, if I wasn't good enough player at the end of it, then so be it. But I was always going to try a decent impression. And you know, and you know, like going on to your point with Eddie and the media, you know, he's he is he's a world class coach, and I think he's also a very he's a very very smart man, and you know, he'll he'll obviously have his games with the media, but I think he definitely puts gets put into a wrong light at some uh, some points uh, by them by just probably the the method of questioning rather than his actual responses. Going into that camp and rubbing shoulders with the kind of big players that have kind of played for England for years. What was it like to be there with them and then also to learn off of them? Um, yeah, I, it's something that I told myself going from sevens into Bath originally because of the calibre players and the superstars that Bath have. I think it's you can't get starstruck. Um, it's something that definitely will count against you going forward because just because you won't be focused on why you're there and you're there because you're as good as them. Um, so it was it was very much just crack on uh put as much effort in as possible don't don't leave anything in reserve um and just try and do you know Eddie, Eddie said to me you're here because uh you're good enough and we we want you to do the stuff that you've been doing in the season so don't try and be anything else just just be yourself so it was massively encouraging um <clears throat> and as as i said before with in terms of my whole rugby career, I, I wanted to go in there and, and make the most out of it because, you know, I, even a month, six weeks before that, I would never have dreamed of being in a World Cup camp. Um, it, well, in an England camp, let alone a World Cup England camp. Pool yeah, stages but... against the US, get your World Cup debut and obviously score your try. Was that kind of looking back over your whole journey so far, was that the kind of cherry on top of the cake of it all in the kind of the reward for it all uh difficult question this um so at, at, at the time um i probably let the whole world cup and england bubble get to me a bit and uh, and almost uh try focused on selection far too much like i felt i was training at the best i could but in the Italy and the USA game, I didn't feel like I did myself just in terms of playing performance. Um, obviously, the try was incredible. And looking back at it now, it's so cool to have have got, um, hopefully not not the only, but uh, two caps for England and, and a try to my name as well. Um, and it just, yeah, I think being there and being out in Japan was probably, was probably the cherry on the cake itself. I think playing was obviously a bonus. Um, but as I said, I, I actually, if you take it back to sort of my competitive nature and probably other other players as well um, that didn't get as much game time, I think at the time it was it was almost a bit annoying because I didn't feel like I'd done myself justice. Um, and if I'd played if I'd played better and played incredibly, 
um, and still not have got picked, then you know it's the same outcome. So um, it didn't it didn't detract um, from the whole experience itself, which was incredible. Is that the aim to get to push for England? Yeah, definitely. I think everyone always wants everyone always wants more caps. You know, I, I personally, I want to I want to put in a sort of a you always want that ten out of ten performance, but I'd love to do it for for my country and um, have the opportunity to do so. Um, and you know, it is it's an incredible squad to be a part of, and, and there's still a lot of guys in there from the World Cup. Um, so I think the the thought process behind wanting to be the best team there ever has been I think is is a great is a great focus focus point on the next four years leading up to that next World Cup because I think mean, why wouldn't you want to be the best team there's ever been um, and I do think we've got the players to do it and you know I'm, I'm, I'm desperately trying to get back into that squad and usually do on a Ballers Blog podcast is we have a top five but this week we've changed it to a top seven due to obviously your career in sevens that you've had um, so it's a top seven players that you've yeah. played with across your career in 15s and 7s. OK, I'm going to try, if I can, section it off. So I'll try and go England, Bath, Uni, Nuneaton, School, and... I'll go. Make, make sure we don't upset anyone. Zealand. I'll try and <laughs> play from each of them. <laughs> uh, oh God! Uh, don't worry, everyone's going to be upset. Um, so I'll start. I'll go early days. I'll go school. Um, I thought uh, probably a guy most talented. I think a guy called Hugh Alderwick, who was our fly half, um, who then went on to sort of play uh he played a bit of uni rugby but he was seriously bright so instead of bashing his body and going through the emotional roller coaster that is professional rugby he chose a different career pathway so i think he's now he's now doing pretty well for himself in the city um i'll go what was the next i'll go rangatown next new zealand um a guy called rookie tapuna who was our scrum half he actually played professionally over here he played professionally for Bristol and Newcastle for a few years uh, after playing with after playing with him in New Zealand and he was just an electric scrum half um, one of the best sevens players I've ever ever seen as well um, uh, yeah so best best player I played with at uni um, I think Mark Lingard is an open side and, and captain for two for two years at uni I think he definitely the, the biggest waste of talent I've seen because I think he could have pushed himself so much more uh, rugby wise. I think he could definitely have made it, if not semi pro, uh, professionally. Um, I think, yeah, just outstanding open side flanker and then uh, great leader as well for the boys. Um, and then we'll go uh, sevens. Best sevens player I played with. Jeez, that's very tough. Um, I think you can't really look past uh, Dan Norton. Um, I think, although, however many skillful players and, and you know and great players there were for England and GB, I think Norts. You know, he's he's. I think he's the best sevens winger there's ever been. Um, I think he's he was the first sort of sevens global superstar um and you know still is today you could you couldn't really uh go to any of the stops on tour did you have many foot races with him in like training that. trying to um, <laughs> <what's> the... <laughs> oh tried yeah <laughs> definitely yeah definitely tried never got anywhere near him <laughs> um so we'll go yeah bath now um, that's five. Is that five or six? I, I haven't done none eating. I'll do none eating first. Uh, none eating. Uh, guy called Jody Peacock, uh, who was a who was a centre. He'd been around a while before me, and I think sort of he was coming into the last year. Um, 
Yeah, yeah big. So, yeah, he'd be my one from then Eaton. And then, yeah, going into Bath. Who's the best friend? Could upset a few people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'll go, I'll stick it very positional focused and, yeah, and go Anthony um, and Watson. Just, I think... Probably, probably people on the outside probably don't um, realise how much he does off the pitch um, to put himself in the best shape possible, and and just actually how smart a player he is. Um, you know, you, you forget that actually wingers don't just finish tries; they do a lot of of other things and a lot of hidden things as well that doesn't get seen or picked up. Um, so I go, yeah, definitely him um, as sort of the best, yeah, best best player I've played with at Bath. Um, and then England, I'd, I'd definitely say most talented. I'll go off off position here. I'll go George Ford. Um, just so, so talented. Seriously skillful. Great reader of the game. Um, and just, yeah, like an awesome lead. Like drives the attack for them. Um, and a great Do you think he sometimes goes a bit underrated for his abilities? Yeah, massively. I think a lot of people will just... It's just very easy to go his size or he's not good on the back foot. But, you know, he's he still puts... He's been putting in incredible performances for Leicester for the last two or three years and they've been a bottom three side. So I don't really understand <laughs> how he can be t- told to not be good on the back foot. Um, yeah, I, I, I think he's massively um, vilified sometimes. Um, and I just think he's, yeah, out, outstanding, outstanding player. Obviously, George Ford is a player who's come from a bit of a family rugby league background, as has Zach Mercer. Um, how important do you think the influence of rugby league on rugby union thinking is at the moment? Yeah, I, th- I think you see a huge crossover at the moment. I think more than ever, I think a lot of coaches are doing it. Um, and then obviously, I think if you've been brought up with whatever code you're playing, I think it can help for the other. Um, you know, we always had a big rivalry at uni, uh, really for no need um, between. There still is, I can tell you. There is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know there still. I think it all. It probably stemmed because um, the All Golds went semi-pro and we weren't semi-pro, so that was probably the only thing that we didn't like about them that they were actually pretty <laughs> decent. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just. I always thought like you could learn so much, so much from it. I think you look at New Zealand and Australia, there's the people like grow up in schools playing both. And it's a massive, it's a massive help going forward. Um, You look at the way Zach, Zach plays himself and just the abrasiveness of his carries and his defense is, is incredible as, as it is with, um, you know, with, with Faz, who's probably the biggest tackler as a 10 in the world. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a massive help. Um, you only you only need to look at how big a success Andy Farrell's been as a player and a coach to show that you can do it in both codes. Thank you very much for joining us today. I think that's all we've got time for. We don't want to go too long. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much <laughs> for joining us. Our no pleasure. Worries. Thank you very much. No, it's been yeah. Been Best great. of luck Good with chat. next season when it comes and. Well, the rest of the season remaining, hopefully. Um, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, well, enjoy your lockdown at the moment. Right. Thank you very Cheers much. Very much. See you. Yeah. Bye. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much for listening to episode three of the Ballers Blog podcast. I apologise for any technical issues we had in which it seemed like I was talking over Rory. Those are the technical issues that will sometimes get the better of us in this world of remote recording. But thank you very much to Rory and Ollie for joining me. Remember to follow our social channels. Our Twitter is at BallersBlog1 and our Instagram is at BallersBlogSport. Thank you once again. Stay safe. See you next week.